check, the Panthers play tomorrow, so nobody should be leaving early, and Ron told me I could have as long as I wanted, so <laughs> please skip, stay here. If you skip out early, remember, Judas left early, too. <laughs> I grew up in this church and in the scout troop, and a favorite form of uh, our pastime when we were on these trips was the telling of stories and jokes, and a favorite form of torture for our leaders was joining us for this. Now and then, when a whole new batch of young scouts would come, Mr. White would stand up and begin telling his favorite joke about a man who built a house. And when he was finished, he had a brick left over, and then Mr. White would scratch his head, look very apologetic, and confess that he was getting older and it was harder and harder to remember what that man did with the brick. The young scouts would be very confused and disappointed in the story and feel sorry for him. And Mr. Blackman would explain that it's a part of old timer's disease, and we'd go on telling jokes. Mr. J White's joke was never very popular. Mr. Blackman, though, had a great joke. He'd tell one where a grumpy old man was riding in a train with a young, snarky woman who had a poodle. The old man was chomping happily on a very large pickle. The young woman became irate as his chomping and his pickle were disturbing and pieces of it were flying everywhere, and it was disturbing her sensitive poodle. He refused a number of times to discard it in the trash, and finally this very angry woman grabbed the pickle, tossed it out the window of the train, and was very satisfied with herself until he grabbed her poodle and threw it out the window. <laughs> As they arrived at the next train station and got off, the poodle got up. And of course, in his mouth, he's got the brick. <laughs> the joke relies on your expectations. It's funny precisely because it's unexpected. God is more than anything master of the unexpected. The birth of Christ isn't so miraculous, so amazing, or funny because it happened and happens in the midst of a historical or seasonal law. It happens instead of what was and is expected to happen. The Jews prophesied, expected, and yearned for a savior, particularly under Roman rule, but many other times in history too. It's why we read Isaiah each year. Christ's coming, life, and death are foretold long before he arrives. But as we're reminded so often, no one expected it in a manger, or in such an unlikely young couple, or right at that moment. No red carpet, no royal treatment, not even a bedroom. They didn't expect a baby, they expected a king. His entrance to Jerusalem on a donkey much later was no different. All the best and most important parts of scripture can be finished not with amen, but with surprise. And Christmas historically replaced the pagan winter solstice. It's no accident. Church leaders wanted to replace the major pagan parties of spring and winter solstice with Easter and Christmas. Christmas, in a way, was the original party of Cooper. It wasn't a party time. Time and time again, we can almost hear God in the background nudging us. See what I did there? But you didn't expect that. Our God is the God of unexpected. The interruption. Unfortunately, too often we do it right back. We love to swoop in and interrupt God and what he's up to with our own agenda and our own punchline. If there was ever a human punchline that fell flat, it's the way we celebrate Christmas in a way in which we replace the anticipation of the birth of our Savior with the anticipation of giving and receiving material goods. And there's some merit to the metaphor of wise men bringing gifts to Jesus and us exchanging gifts. It's symbolic. But much of our season of anticipation, which we call Advent, much of that season has shifted the focus from God's gift to our gifts. We prepare our homes for guests and parties, we prepare a tree as a landing zone for presents, and we prepare our church for visitors and those returning home. And we prepare our minds with the music that we love. And none of those is wrong or bad. In fact, scripture encourages many of those practices. But far too often we don't prepare our hearts for the gift that Christ is to our lives. There's a comedian who points out how much we forget and how disconnected we are. As he says, kids eat chocolate eggs at Easter because the chocolate reminds us of the wood on the cross. And the bunnies remind us of the rabbit holes where the cross was stuck in the ground, right? No. And at Christmas, Jesus was born to a large, jolly guy in a red suit. Not exactly. And there are no fir trees in Nazareth, I've checked. He reminds us that eggs and bunnies were pagan symbols of fertility. And trees were symbols of growth and nature and harvest, not of Jesus and resurrection and Christianity. 
When we find our meaning in traditions, instead of building traditions that focus on meaning, we lose something very important. If you really want to start a fight in a church, and who doesn't, forget about recent changes in the PCUSA. I have an idea. We'll have people sit on this side of the sanctuary if they insist in waiting until after Christmas or after Thanksgiving for Christmas music on the radio, and we'll have everyone else who is ready for it early to sit over here. We won't do that this morning. Not that I think I can get any of you to change your seats. <laughs> Countless times, I've been a part of conversations at this time of the year where people share their thoughts on preparing for the holidays. It's not really Christmas until... When is it Christmassy to you? Christmas lights here in the South can be up year-round, so that's not necessarily a good indication. For some, the first cold weather or snowfall. For some, the first Christmas carol that we sing or watching White Christmas or Miracle on 34th Street or Rudolph. For some, it's that first holiday batch of cookies or when their family arrives in town or getting the Christmas tree up and maybe leaving it up till mid-January. For my mom, it was when we finally read the Luke passage that Charles Scholes insisted be a part of the Charlie Brown Christmas special, even when producers asked him to remove it. As shepherds kept watch with their flocks by night. How do we prepare our hearts for the coming of Christmas, for the coming of Christ? Now you might suspect I have some suggestions. A young Katie Blackwelder once accused me of having an opinion about everything. And I've thought about this God and Jesus subject just a little. I even took some classes on it. And Jesus says, and I think I agree with him, we should always be prepared. Prepared as servants waiting for the master of the house to come home. It is preparation and anticipation as much as anything as human beings that gives us meaning. We spend Lent preparing for Easter. We spend Palm Sunday preparing for Holy Week. And Advent is our preparation for Christmas. We prepare not a footbridge or a hiking trail for the king to arrive, for the prince of peace to enter. We prepare a highway. We prepare a runway. We prepare because it sets a priority in our lives. All else comes after that. Preparation is the ultimate in priority setting. Guests are important. Their comfort and happiness is above our own, so we change things. We pick up the house more because we want them to be more comfortable than how we live each day. We kick the kids out of beds, on the couches and on the floors, and into sleeping bags because grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles are more important. We cook food that we know others love, even if we can't remember what it is because they are a priority. Parents spend hours wrapping gifts for children because their happiness and joy and memories mean more to them than a few hours of sleep. And my heart is warm when I see people take items to the angel tree or fill shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child or see folks make plans to visit the homebound or their lonely relatives. Making time for such things in the midst of the busiest time of our year shows a priority of love. For the one who taught us that we will be known as his followers, when we love one another. Taking time every single day for three weeks to read from an Advent calendar, from scripture, with your family, with children, taking time to tell the story, to build an anticipation, to make your faith and passing on that faith a priority. That is Advent in its purest form. Many people will cringe at the greeting, Happy Holidays. Others will delight in having brothers and sisters who share in the faith which Jesus was raised, and with other traditions. I won't ask you to divide the sanctuary on that one either. That could get ugly. But, after all, the wise men were neither Jews nor Christians, and the innkeeper who loaned the stable may have even been a Roman. And I won't ask you to remember the reason for the season, or the real gift of Christmas and abandon all your favorite holiday traditions. I will challenge you, though, that if there isn't room in your traditions for truly anticipating the Christ child, if your faith and your Savior, your Savior aren't the obvious priority amongst your preparations, you should take some time to make at least as much room in your lives as an innkeeper once did. Years ago, I heard a story, very likely from Ron, where a church put on a nativity play and all the children participated including one little boy who was mentally handicapped. The little boy was very friendly, very kind, and well-loved. And he wanted very much to be a part of this play. He wanted to have lines. 
So those in charge made him one of several innkeepers who turned Mary and Joseph away. It seemed safe. His only line was, there is no room here. It was a small line, and he delivered it perfectly and with enthusiasm each time. But the adults and his parents all held their breath on the night of the show. Would he freeze up? Would he be able to deliver? When Mary and Joseph arrived and asked if they had a place for them to stay, he delivered his line perfectly in a booming voice. There is no room here. And as Mary and Joseph turned to walk away, very disappointed, his lip quivered, and he nearly burst into tears. And he shouted after them, Oh, come on in. We can make room for you, Jesus. <laughs> can we make room? So maybe, just maybe, you can find a more fitting place in your home, in your heart. So it begins to look a little more like Christmas than just a little more like a holiday. Maybe as we celebrate Advent each week this year, you can make hope and peace, joy and love a part of your lives. And all of our traditions can reflect the anticipation we share for the birth of a child. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Amen.